FedEx's big promise to their customer base is that we will deliver your packages on time. They had that famed commercial of if it absolutely positively needs to be delivered by you know tomorrow, we'll make it happen. Well, that's the promise they make. Then we say, what's the one function, the one activity, the one doing activity that is most important in making that promise a reality? Therefore, what's the one function that supports our survivability and thrivability? Because we've determined that delivering packages on time is what we want to be known for, what we want to thrive on. Well, the one activity behind that uh, that's most important to FedEx is logistics, the movement of packages. Therefore, they need to invest in and protect logistics more than anything else. It is the number one activity to the point where if it's getting threatened, they have to reallocate resources to get it up and running again. And it's, it's funny, it gets, or ironic, it gets threatened every single year, usually around the winter holidays. You know, when we're recording this, we're starting to approach them very rapidly. And what happens is shipping demand increases. More packages get shipped during the final quarter than any other quarter uh, by a long shot. What FedEx does is they don't say, hey, drivers drive faster, drive better. No, the management team gets their butts from behind those desks and out into the trucks themselves. They hire additional staff. They make sure the QBR logistics for them keeps humming along. So in the step two, as small business owners, we need to figure out what's the promise we're making to our customer? What's the one thing we want to known, be known for? What's our thrive factor? Then rewind from this thrive factor, the one thing you want to be known for and say, what's the most important thing making the thrive factor a reality? That activity is the QBR. It needs to be served and protected. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Doing creative work can be kind of lonely, and that's why we built the Unmistakable Listener Tribe. The tribe is a community for professionals to connect and support each other. Everything is designed to help you grow your business and share what's working and what isn't. And that's true whether you're a business owner or an artist. You'll get access to feedback, live conversations with guests, and so much more. By joining the tribe, you become part of a community of creators who all support each other, and it's completely free. Hopefully, I'll see you there. Visit unmistakablecreative.com slash tribe to join. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash tribe. Mike, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So uh, one, as I was just saying before we hit record here, I interviewed you probably six years ago back when we were called Blogcast yeah. FM, the podcast for bloggers. You have written multiple books since and you have a new book called Clockwork, which we are going to talk about. But before we get there, I want to start by asking you, what did your parents do for a living and what impact did that end up having on the choices that you've made with your life and your career? Oh, yeah, it's interesting. So um, my father was an engineer his whole life for, for one company called Foster Wheeler. Um, and it was interesting. It, the impact that that had on me was the expectation for working for one company for the entirety of my life. Um, that's that's the expectation he set for me too. to you know, find that company and serve them well and they'll serve you well. Uh, my mother was was a homemaker, and uh, after we, my sister and I started going to school um, in high school, she got a job and, and worked part time again for a corporation. The interesting thing is, no entrepreneur, no entrepreneurship in the recent generations that I know of in my family. Um, so the impact it's had is by being an entrepreneur, it's actually confusing. Both my parents are still living today, and it's just conf- confusing for them. They're like, I. I don't, I don't really understand what you do. Um, and I don't think there's a disapproval. It's just, it's very alien to them. And so maybe it's inspired me to try to prove that you can be successful as an entrepreneur. Um, they definitely haven't dissuaded me and they're wonderful supporters, always encouraging me, but I don't think they get it, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, to be around parents uh, who work, particularly dad who worked the same company for almost his entire life and set the expectation that you would go out and do the same. That's a a pretty strong imprint to have been had to have had drilled into your head, particularly when you're young. How did you overcome that programming, uh, your social programming and, and how do other people do that? Yeah, well, for me, it just, it took about, uh, one day I I tried to get a job out of college. I should say take one day, but I was trying to get a job and I couldn't with a big corporation. 
um, I, I believed it, right? So I, I wanted to work for that big company, but they, they wouldn't extend a job. I, I couldn't get it. So it forced me to work for a little business. And when I worked for a small business, that was a great insight to how small business operates. You know, I understood if you work for a business, a large corporation, you're a cog in the wheel. Uh, and when you were for a small business, I didn't appreciate the freedom you have to do things uh, to explore and learn. So by working for a small business, I fell in love with the uh, process of of what it was like to own a small business, even though I didn't own it. I was just an employee within one. And that got me excited. Um, I thought one day I could make more money doing this. If I owned the business, I thought I'd have more fun, more control. And I thought, and this was wrong. I, I looked at the business owner of the current place I was working at the time and said, this guy sits back smoke cigars uh, while I'm hustling my butt off. Why not me be the guy sitting there back smoking cigars? Well, I realized he was actually trying to do the accounting and he was steeped in panic of trying to find money to fund the business. I didn't realize that the challenges that he was uh, really facing, um, but it did inspire me to pursue and start my own company. What was the first company you started? Uh, it was called Olmec. It still exists today. O l m e c dot com is the website. It was acquired by private equity, and it's it's grown to one of the premier providers in that space. It was a computer services business. When I, when I think I sold it, I think we we're doing you know, somewhere between two and a half, three million. Uh, and today, I think it's a ten or fifteen million dollar company. Mm. Um, they really took it to the next level. It, it it took me eight. It took me six years to get to the first million. I think it took me eight or nine years to get it to two plus. Um, and that's when I had a, uh, an offer I couldn't, couldn't reject, sold the business, uh, and then started a new business. So as a byproduct of your experiences, uh, with your various businesses, you've written a number of books, particularly, uh, about various subjects like operating a business and, and all of that. So where does this perspective come from? Like, where did you end up having this perspective about all the various things that you have led to your books. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's in part from running businesses and anytime I think I'm a sole Island, like I'm the only person that struggles with profitability. Why can't I figure this out? I'm the only person that's like a workaholic and working all the time. And, and the business is being carried on my own back. I, I realize now every time I say that I'm not the only one, there's probably others. Now I think there's countless others. So that's part of it. But secondly, um, it, it was, the failures I had that have defined this. So I did build and sell two businesses, which, you know, it's a blessing. It's wonderful. I wish it upon everyone that desires that because it is an extraordinary experience. But the same the, on the flip side, I was full of arrogance and ignorance. I, I thought I knew everything about entrepreneurship. Um, I decided to start this one business that was an angel investment fund. And um, I sucked at it. I, w- I was horrible. So these businesses collapsed. I actually started 10 companies I think it was about six months in, all of them were either under already or, or going down. And I was blowing money left and right. It, it put me on the brink of bankruptcy. And um, that became this new awakening, if that's the right term. Like, holy crap, I don't know much about entrepreneurship at all. I need to really study this. I need to bone up on it. So I looked at all the challenges I faced, the lack of profitability. Well, how do you become permanently profitable? The, the, work, the workaholic challenge I'm facing hiring problems, you name it, all these different challenges. I've been investigating them. And one by one, I'm writing books about how to achieve or fix those problems. And quite frankly, it's an accountability mechanism for myself. I just, you know, I released Profit First and now goes back four or five years. Um, I've been doing Profit First for myself for 10 years plus, but uh, there's no way I can not do it. I I mean, I'd be the biggest fraud if I said, yeah, yeah, read this book, but no, I don't, I don't take that medicine. I don't do it. Mm -hmm. It's nonsense. So I live by profit first. Uh, My more recent work is clockwork, which is about uh, time efficiency and, and having a business run on its own, which mandates that you need to leave your business for an extended period, four weeks consecutively. So that's what I do. My next one is in December. I'm leaving from December to January, um, totally disconnecting digitally and everything from my office and letting it run on its own. So the, the funny, maybe ironic part of writing books is if I don't live by this, I'm a fraud. So every book I write, I need to elevate my game further. And, and I like that pressure. I really like it. 
Remember more, improve your focus, and multitask better. Hum is a brain sharpener that helps you do all three. Hum's wearable boosts your working memory and will be available in late 2021. Sign up to be notified when Hum launches and to learn more about the science behind Hum at thinkhum.com. That's thinkhumm.com. Hum is designed for healthy adults and should not be used if you're pregnant, have cognitive impairment, implanted devices, or a history of seizures. The Hum patch is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. To learn more, go to thinkhum.com. Subscribe to Ready to Trade, a new two-part series exploring the opportunities in the UK's e-commerce and healthcare sectors with business leaders in each landscape. The UK has taken huge steps in terms of our ability to transform and rethink the way that we deliver healthcare services. Those lessons that we've learned can apply to our international partners. Ready to Trade is available to download and is produced by Reuters Plus in partnership with the UK's Department for International Trade. Sound plays a much bigger role in our lives than most of us even are aware of. An EPOS podcast powered by audio tells stories behind the sounds we hear every day, sounds that inform, entertain, educate, get our attention, influence our behavior, and save our lives. Randy Zuckerberg and her guests explore how audio shapes our experience and how pioneers are creating the sound of the future. You know all those sounds from your devices when you're using apps or receiving text messages or anything else online? Well, it turns out somebody actually has a job doing that. Randy talks to the experts behind these sounds to find out about the work that goes into designing what she calls those sonic logos. As a podcast host, I think a lot about how sound impacts us, whether we're hearing it on a podcast or from a notification on a phone or from some app we're using. And if you want to learn more about the impact that sound has on our lives, listen and subscribe to EPOS is powered by audio on Acast, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So we're going to get into all the principles in clockwork. Uh, but I do have to ask about the profit first piece because I, I, I finished like right after I finished reading clockwork, I went and ordered that book. Can you talk about the framework of, of profit first briefly and explain to us why people screw this up and where they go wrong with, with managing their finances in a business? Yeah. So what I understand is the vast majority of businesses are not profitable. Uh, there was a study that, that I read or heard of um, that said 83% of small businesses survive check by check. They don't have an, a significant profit at the end of the year. Or if they do, it's an accounting profit. They don't have a cash bonus waiting for them. So I suspect the majority of your listeners right now who are entrepreneurs are experiencing the same thing. They they live on a check to check basis. If they don't have a sale this month of significance, the business is in trouble. If uh, And let alone when at the end of the year, if they're lucky to have owners pay, they're, they're not going to have profit. Well, this is what I realized for myself too. And I said, how, how can it be that so many of us struggle with profit? Like we can get so much right in our business. We're able to attract clients and prospects. We're able to deliver the services and goods. We're like so capable at so many things in our business, but we can't figure out profit. I literally said to myself, is there a piece of our brain that's missing to figure out this one simple thing, but critically important. And that's when I realized uh, there's nothing wrong with us. The system we follow is flawed. And what the fundamental system is, is the foundational gap formula. It stands for generally accepted accounting principles. And in these generally accepted rules, one of the rules says that you take your sales, you subtract your expenses, and what's left over is profit. It's actually the foundational formula of gap. Sales minus expenses equals profit. But here's the problem. when for, for, Logically, I get it. Logically, that is a wonderful formula. Behaviorally, it's absolutely hard because what it says is profit comes last. And here, here's what it is. It's human nature. When we put something last, we're saying it's insignificant. If I say, you know, it's starting today, my health comes last. I'm saying I give a crap about my health. I would never say that. I say my health starting today comes first. When we use the word first, we mean it's priority, it's important, and it gets addressed. If we say something comes last, we say it can wait. It's the perpetual manana syndrome. So for most businesses, profit isn't considered until like the end of the year. And when it's not there, they say, oh, shucks, maybe next year. And we never achieve profitability. So profit first is a behavioral-based system. How it works is we flip the formula to say sales minus profit equals expenses. In practice, what we do is every time we have a sale, we immediately take a predetermined percentage of that revenue, call it profit, hide it away. We actually transfer that money hide it away, and then we live off the remainder for our business. That's the foundational principle of Profit First. Hmm. 
Okay. Well, that's, that's a lot simpler than, than I thought it was based on having read the book. <laughs> I know you <laughs> well, did. There's, all- there's a lot of steps to it, but that's the foundational principle. Okay. In execution, we need to set up multiple accounts. So, so I can share some of the execution if that would help too. Yeah, totally. Okay. Okay. So here, here's how we do an execution. With the business itself, I found that most entrepreneurs manage their business by doing what's called bank balance accounting. Now, traditional accounting is where you look at your income statement and your balance sheet and your cash flow statement. You know your KPIs, which is your key performance indicators. You know your budget. Uh, you know certain metrics, the OCR, which is called the operating cash ratio is a critical one. There's always pieces. And I'll tell you, as people are hearing that, you, your eyes may be rolling back in your head right now because that is like really sophisticated and boring stuff. What I realized for myself, and I believe most entrepreneurs, is I don't read any of those documents, especially on a routine basis. I don't sit here every week and review those documents. What I do do is every day I log into my bank account and I follow the entrepreneur system, which is real simple. If I have money, I know I have money I can spend. And if I don't have money, well, then panic ensues and I need to make a sale. So I do this thing called bank balance accounting. Based upon the balance in the bank, I make decisions. Well, profit first, then what I I designed it to be is, is to be inserted within that behavior. So every time I, um, I log in my bank account, I now have multiple bank accounts as opposed to just one checking account. I have minimally five. I have an account for income just to show how much sales is coming in, cash deposits, but it also has an account for profit. So I can allocate a percentage for profit. It has an account toward owner's pay, tax, operating expenses, and a more sophisticated business over time will have even more accounts. The idea is as money flows into that income account, we then take it from there and we divide it up. We apportion it to these different accounts prior to the use of the funds. So I put money in the profit account and it sits there simply being allocated to a profit. It's not to be used for any other purposes. I put money into the tax account. That's there to pay the tax liabilities of the owner themselves, their income tax, um, but also the corporate tax. And then the operating expense account is what I actually need to operate the business off of. So by... I guess the word's bifurcating the money prior to using it, you know it's intended use. The, the trap we fall into is we don't do this. You see one checking account, you see that $10,000 deposit. And you're like, oh, I got 10,000 bucks. I can do X and it becomes very reactionary. I can, you know, whatever bill has been paid up, you pay or you think you can make that higher, but we react to what's in the moment. If instead we follow the profit first system and we divide that $10,000 up into different accounts, maybe a thousand bucks is your profit, something that's going to be, used to reward you in the future. So we hide that away. Maybe there's a 15 or $2,000, $1,500 or $2,000 tax liability uh, for your income that's going to come out of this. So we're going to allocate that 1,500 bucks away. Um, We got to pay you, the owner, which arguably for most businesses is the most important employee. So we allocate money there. And at the end of the day, you may realize you don't have $10,000 to operate your business. Maybe it's more like $4,000 or $6,000, but that's what you have to operate your business off of. And I, and I was saying, if if when you allocate money to the operating expense account and you can't pay your bills, when you can't pay your bills, your business is telling you you can't afford your bills. There's something fundamentally wrong with the business that we need to resolve. So that's the the implementation of the pay yourself first principle mm-hmm. to uh, to business. And you talked about not using like typical banks, right? Yeah. So so I don't suggest using the big national banks. Not anything against them. Um, but I'll also give you a lot for small banks. What I found is small regional banks often are much more flexible when it comes to fees. Many of them actually don't even charge you minimum bank account fees. Uh, they don't charge you transfer fees. And the importance here, of course, is that when we um, have money bouncing between different accounts, they're going to hit minimum balances at time as we use the money. These big banks, not all of them, but some of them, many of them, will charge you a fee and that that starts to undermine the system. So I found small regional banks are exceptional. I also found credit unions. I love federal credit unions. That's actually who we use. Very good experience. No um, no fees for moving money around these different accounts. No fees to set up an account. And my favorite part is when I go to the bank, which I go once a quarter to, to, to distribute our profit, they know me. Like I walk in like, hey, Mike, how you doing? When I went to the big national bank, it was it was the teller of the month club. Um, I, I never knew who was there, which gives me with these small banks and the, the credit unions more confidence. They're more accommodating to my needs. So uh, I just recommend checking them out. Uh, I just found them to be superior in the vast majority of cases for the profit first system. And you can do all of this like on the internet, right? 
Yeah. Oh yeah. The, the funniest thing is I found that the best technology is often with the small banks, which actually sounds counterintuitive because these mega banks have so much more funding. But the thing is the small banks and credit unions are often using uh, platforms that's been established for many of them. So, you know, 500 or a thousand small banks will all rely on the same uh, banking software uh, that they use collectively. And these other banks have their one-offs. So it's these smaller banks often that have much more sophisticated things. So like, you know, doing remote deposits online stuff. I've been doing that for almost 10 years now through my little credit union where some of the big banks are still rolling stuff like that out. Wow. Well, let's do this. Uh, let's shift gears and get into why you're actually here, which is to talk about your new book, Clockwork, and this idea of designing a business to run itself. So yeah. you basically break this down into what you call the seven steps of clockwork. Uh, so could you walk us through them and, and give us kind of a, an overview of each, overview of each one and how we implement them into our lives and our businesses? Yeah, for sure. And uh, I'm going to do this off the top of my head. So if I, if I miss a step, I may have to pop back to the book. Yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, and I live these steps. Uh, I go through it, but sometimes I, I jumble them together. So the first step is this. I call it the 4D mix in the book. And what it is, is an understanding and an analysis of the four stages that a business exists in. Now, it actually exists in all these stages at all times, but it's the entrepreneur's responsibility if they want to be a true entrepreneur, to move themselves to the highest level of these four Ds. And it is, stands for the letter D. Um, and each of these four stages starts with the letter D. So the, the first stage is called uh, the doing stage. Every business at all times must be doing something that delivers benefit to the customer. Obviously, you won't be able to retain your customers. So this is the activity of delivering a product or service or good to your customer. And it's any activities that support the delivery of goods and services to your customers. So if you're a pizza shop, it's the delivery of the pizza, the making of the pizza, but it's also the, uh, it's creating the, the, the bill through the point of sale system. It's also the inquiry into the suppliers to get the flour and the tomato sauce and the other things you need. So all those activities are what's considered doing because they either derive direct benefits to the customer or they, they support the delivery to the customer. The next level of D stands for deciding. Many small businesses uh, go to this stage, the entrepreneur moves on to this stage, but often get stuck here. And deciding is where you have multiple resources, people, software, but let's just talk about the people part mostly. Well, you bring on people to start helping with your business, doing some activities, you know, the first phase. They're, they're now doing some of the doing work. But they come into us with this stream of questions so they can do their job well. Like if I was working for you and you say, hey, Mike, I need you to, um, to you know, invoice or something. I say, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do the invoicing. And you say, you know, just, just follow <clears throat> our procedure here. And I, I come back with a minute later and say, hey, boss, quick question. Um, did you want me to sort these invoices by last name or first name or whatever? And then you make a decision. You say, Mike, you know what? Uh, let's do it by last name. We've always done it that way. Go, do it. And I come back a second later, I'm like, oh, good question. Um, how are we billing in increments of 15 minutes or half hours or, or do we do project time? You're like, oh, well, you know, never considered that. We should do 30 minute increments. And I go back out and I come back and I'm like, hey boss, another question. Uh, you know, should, should I put detail in the notes or not? I'll put details in. I come back with this incessant stream of questions, which actually in the beginning, the new employee is a sense of relief because that means this employee is a learner. They're trying to grow themselves. But when that employee continues this stream of questions, you know, six months into this, it's like, oh my gosh, are these people idiots? Can they not figure this out? How much do they need to learn? The problem is twofold. Now, this is the deciding phase. This is where we are making the decisions for our employees. There is uh, many statues and stuff dedicated to this experience. There's a Hindu goddess named Kali that's dedicated to this experience where it's one head with multiple arms. And that's what we become. We become one head with eight or 12 arms flapping around. You can only manage so much uh, people this way because you can't do any of your own work. You're constantly deciding for everyone else. The reason this perpetuates is the employee is highly motivated to ask questions because if they take your direction and follow your direction, they can never do any wrong. You know, they make a mistake or, or the outcome is not what you wanted. Well, it's not their fault. They followed your explicit directions. The entrepreneur often gets stuck here too because the entrepreneur's ego is being fed. It's like, oh, 
you know, swooped in, put out another fire. I'm a hero. Or it's just easier just for me to tell them what to do as opposed to have to explain the process. So it's a convenience play actually on both sides. The only way out of this is to elevate to the next D in the 4D mix, which stands for delegation. And delegation is not the assignment of tasks. That's what people think it is. It's the assignment of outcomes. An outcome is where you say, um, Mike, I want to make sure that we bill our clients accurately and timely. Do you agree to the importance of that? You know, assigning me the responsibility to invoice is the assignment of a task. Assignment of it's important to bill accurately and timely is an assignment of an outcome. Then what we do is you say, hey, Mike, uh, here's our best practice for achieving this. But as you go through this process, if you have any questions or you run into any roadblocks, the responsibility is for you to find out the solution. I'm, I want you, that's why I hired you for your brains, to figure this out. That's what the assignment of outcomes is, and it's the empowerment of decision-making. Now, of course, employees will resist it. It's still more convenient just to come back and say, what should I do now, boss? So in those situations, we need to have the discipline of saying, well, you tell me what you are going to do. That's it. I'm, I'm not going to tell you. You have to do it yourself. It's, it's the pushback so they reach their own decisions. But And I think most people don't even know that. I, I don't know if any people actually even execute on it, but I do know they know it. There's one more part, which I argue is probably the most important thing, yet it's the least frequently executed and very rarely known. When you assign an employee an outcome and empower them to make the decisions around it, when they make a decision, you must always reward the fact that they made a decision even, and this is the kicker here, even if it's a bad decision. So what I'm saying is the employee comes back and says, you know, that invoicing, uh, I've been following our procedure. I noticed that it takes about, um, it'll be just more efficient if I sort people by their middle initial. I think that's going to be our system. And now it becomes this nightmare, like you sort by their middle initial. So we go back to the employee and say, listen, um, even though the outcome we wanted, you know, timely and Accurate billing is now a little bit cluttered. The fact that you made a decision that you felt was in the best interest of our business is a significant move. I'm very proud of you for making a decision that you felt move us forward. Good job. Now, we need to improve this outcome. We're not there yet. So I want you to find an alternative method, but keep making decisions like this. You're extraordinary. That's what we need to do. And so few entrepreneurs reward decision-making that they actually disempower their employees. You can only empower them when you reward them for all decision-making, even bad decisions. The irony, of course, is we do this for ourselves. We, uh, Whenever we make a mistake, it's not like, oh, you're fired, self. No, instead you say, um, oh, shucks, not the way to do it. Let me try a different way. Once you uh, are in this third stage of true delegation, that will automatically elevate us to the highest level of business, which is designing. And designing is where you have clarity on a specific vision or outcome you want for your business then you're making tactical and strategic decisions to get us there. Instead of living in the moment and saying, oh my God, we need a sale today, or oh my, we need to do this. Now you say, we need a sale today, um, and we need to make sure the sale we make is consistent with it getting us to the vision we have for the business. Once you add that additional qualification, the likelihood of you achieving the outcome increases a hundredfold. Most businesses are just in the OS moment, and keep on um, just doing anything to survive. Businesses that really flourish are by design, and the entrepreneur has a clear definition of the outcome they want to achieve and make decisions that are congruent with that outcome. So that's the first step in the seven-step process. Remember more, improve your focus, and multitask better. Hum is a brain sharpener that helps you do all three. Hum's wearable boosts your working memory and will be available in late 2021. Sign up to be notified when Hum launches and to learn more about the science behind Hum at thinkhum.com. That's thinkhumm.com. Hum is designed for healthy adults and should not be used if you're pregnant, have cognitive impairment, implanted devices, or a history of seizures. The Hum patch is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. To learn more, go to thinkhum.com. This episode of The Unmistakable Creative is supported by Remote Works, a podcast that tells extraordinary stories of teams that made the shift to flexible working. If there's anything that last year taught us, it's that the way we work has changed forever. And in each episode of Remote Works, host Melanie Green tells an insightful story about how people and companies are adapting. She talks about the very problems that all of us are dealing with. 
Last season, in Preventing Burnout, people learned about the challenges and rewards of working remotely during the pandemic. Now, I don't know about you, but I have definitely felt that there are days when I am burned out, and sometimes I don't even know when I am done working because it's all I do. A recent study found that 75% of workers have experienced burnout, and 40% said their burnout was a direct result of the pandemic. But what if we don't know the signs of impending burnout? You'll hear firsthand from someone who has been through burnout, as well as get expert advice on how to recognize it and what you can do to prevent it from happening. In this season, Remote Works explores several other topics related to the new world of work. For those of you who are baseball fans that are missing those days of eating overpriced hot dogs and drinking oversized beers, they pull back the curtain at Major League Baseball for a glimpse of how America's most beloved pastime is working remotely. You'll hear how the MLB has had to adjust just about everything that they do, from new rules about how we gather to virtual fans in stadium. You'll get to look at how they've embraced this new world of flexible work. I recently listened to the burnout episode of the Remote Works podcast, and here's what I thought. Melanie does an amazing job bringing in diverse perspectives from experts and people who are dealing with the issues these experts are trying to solve. It's basically a combination of great storytelling with practical advice that you can apply to your life or your work. So search for Remote Works anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thanks to Remote Works for their support. Wow. Okay, uh, let's get into the second one because I, I think basically based on just having heard that, this will probably take us the rest of the conversation. Uh, right, right, exactly, exactly. So these other ones get a little bit shorter, but this next one's actually a, a big one too. The other ones are yeah, shorter. declaring the corporate ne- queen bee. Yeah, exactly. So the next level, level two is called the QBR or queen bee role. And what was fascinating is as I was researching for clockwork, I was trying to find what was the common thread of efficiency across all types of businesses, trying to be business agnostic, trying to pick the most efficient businesses in all different industries and then identify the common thread. And I I could not find a common thread. They all had their kind of hacks and secrets, but there was nothing consistent I could find until I found uh, beehives. Now, beehives, these organisms, these colonies, while they're not human-based, they're insect-based, extraordinarily efficient, and they have a, a fabulous rule system. It's two rules. And what every bee knows is that rule one is make sure the queen bee is producing eggs. The, the, what this means is the role, the QBR, queen bee role, the function of laying eggs is the most critical. And, and why it is for beehives is uh, bees die very quickly. The, some species will die within four weeks of, of a new bee being born. Um, some of them can last up to six months, but not many longer than that. So there's a lot of you know turnover, if you will, in beehives. So these bees know that if there's not sufficient egg production, the entire colony is being compromised. That is the most important thing. And that's what the survivability and therefore thriveability of a beehive is contingent upon. Now, don't, don't confuse this. And this is where some entrepreneurs get confused. When we do the parallel in business, I want you to realize there's also a queen bee role in your business, most important function, but the bee serving it, the queen bee is not, not the most important bee. All bees have equal importance. The queen bee just happens to be serving the most important role. If she's failing to produce, she'll be immediately removed from the hive or killed and a new queen bee will be spawned. In our business, skip the killing part, but if someone's not able to produce the QBR level, they should not be the ones serving the QBR. And the nice thing about business is you don't need just one person or individual serving it. It can be a multitude. So the queen bee role is the most important function. Every bee knows rule one, protect it. Rule two is only when the queen bee role is performing properly and fully, do they then revert to their primary job function, their own you know personal QBR, if you will, their, their primary job. And it could be collecting pollen or defending the hive or cooling or heating the hive, but they all have a rule. So here's how it translates to business. Every business has a queen bee role. The most important function the business hinges on. You have to determine what it is. It's always a doing activity. It's always a doing activity. But what is this activity that you are betting your company's survivability, therefore thrivability on? You're you're hinging your success on. I'll give you an example. Um, FedEx, just pick a large corporate name because... I know they're not a small business, but it applies to large or small business. We all know the FedEx brand. FedEx's big promise to their customer base is that we will deliver your packages on time. They had that famed commercial of if it absolutely positively needs to be delivered by you know tomorrow, we'll make it happen. Well, 
That's the promise they make. Then we say, what's the one function, the one activity, the one doing activity that is most important in making that promise a reality? Therefore, what's the one function that supports our survivability and thrivability? Because we've determined that delivering packages on time is what we want to be known for, what we want to thrive on. Well, the one activity behind that uh, that's most important to FedEx is logistics, the movement of packages. Therefore, they need to invest in and protect logistics more than anything else. It is the number one activity to the point where if it's getting threatened, they have to reallocate resources to get it up and running again. And it's, it's funny, it gets or ironic, it gets threatened every single year, usually around the winter holidays. You know, when we're recording this, we're starting to approach them very rapidly. And what happens is shipping demand increases. More packages get shipped during the final quarter than any other quarter uh, by a long shot. What FedEx does is they don't say, hey, drivers drive faster, drive better. No, the management team gets their butts from behind those desks and out into the trucks themselves. They hire additional staff. They make sure the QBR logistics for them keeps humming along. So in the step two, as small business owners, we need to figure out what's the promise we're making to our customer? What's the one thing we want to known, be known for? What's our thrive factor? Then rewind from this thrive factor, the one thing you want to be known for and say, what's the one activity within the business, the one doing activity that makes that thrive factor most a most reality, most likely to make it a reality? What's the most important thing making the thrive factor a reality? That activity is the QBR. It needs to be served and protected. That's what we do in the second phase, identify the QBR. So in a case like mine, for example, it would probably be writing and producing the podcast, right? Right, right. So, you know, your your intention and you're pulling it off is to have an extraordinary podcast, right? One that changes the face of entrepreneurship. Maybe that's how you define it. Then we rewind and say, what's the one activity that most supports it? Now, you actually said two. It's the production and the recording of podcasts. If you have to be between the two, which factor is more important for the success of the show? Is it the performance of the host and the guests or is it the the script? Then put everything into that. Well, this, listen, if you say it's the performance of the host and the guest, um, I'm not saying now that the script doesn't matter. It is important, but it's not the most important thing. If, if the script is a little bumpy or choppy, your clients will be okay with that. But the second you slip on the quality of your guests or the energy of the show, you're going to start losing business. So we can never compromise the QBR, the primary job function, to satisfy other stuff. The other stuff is still important, but it, it always takes a second seat to the QBR. Okay. Wow. Wow. Okay. So let's talk specifically about systems because I think this is one of those things that uh, I, I've realized systems are so critical to everything that I do. Like I have an idea capture system and I, I, I realized if I didn't capture my ideas, I would never be able to capitalize on them. Right. Uh, so let's talk, let's talk specifically about systems. You basically say document or record the systems you already have in place. Your team can do the work you want them to. Right. And this, this is the fourth step in, uh, in clockwork. The third step, just so your listeners don't feel we, we skirted a step, is the protect and serve. So stage two is identify the QBR. Stage three is to empower your team to act like the bees. When, when they see the QBR struggling, they are empowered to take action, notify someone. You know, if you see something, say something or even take action themselves to serve it. Systems, the capturing of systems is stage four. And the goal here is to, as an entrepreneur, we got to take off the doing work off your plate and uh, start giving other team members that responsibility. We actually even need to remove the deciding and delegating phases off your plate too, so you can move purely to the design phase. Well, to do this, we have to do what's called capture systems. The traditional method has been doing SOPs or standard operating procedures. And what I found is most businesses in modern times are struggling with SOPs. The problem is twofold. One is an SOP, which is a written documented procedure, step one, step two, step three, uh, to produce them is time consuming, but their relevance is very short lived, particularly with technology. So if I develop a procedure, which I did for our team here for shipping, and it says go to the UPS website and log in and enter this data and put in this numbers and so forth, get the label, stick it on the box and send it out. Um, the problem is it's laborious to create it, but the second I created it, and this happened in our office, uh, I was gave I documented the procedure myself. I gave it to 
my colleague Amy here to do it. She came back a second later and said, oh, hey, Mike, um, I tried to log into the UPS website. They updated the website. It's totally different. This OP, SOP doesn't apply anymore. And I literally had to rewrite the SOP, which points to the fact that, and the UPS has updated their websites two more times since that. So documenting a process um, is time consuming, and then it becomes irrelevant very quickly if technology advances past it. So the better way to transfer systems is no longer SOPs. It's actually through capturing systems. And what I mean is if you do activities through your computer, you can use screen capture software. Right now I'm a a fan of Loom. It's L-O-O-M. It's a free recording software for short videos. We use that regularly. We actually produce some videos today. And what you do is you record the activity as you do it. So the shipping procedure that I'm doing on my computer, I can go, I log into the UPS site and as I'm actually doing a shipment to getting work done, I'm also recording the activity and then give it to my employee and say, replicate this. So it's a much more efficient way to, uh, to capture what we're doing. And if it's a physical thing, like a moving box or something, you can use your smartphone and record it through audio and, and a film recorder. The, and I think many people know this, uh, you can use a Google drive or some kind of cloud drive to store all your videos on it. We have hundreds now of videos. The beautiful thing is that it's quick transfer. Now, Amy, who takes over the work, just watches the procedure I just did minutes ago, and now she can replicate it. Uh, it has permanence. It stores on our network structure. So if Amy leaves and uh, and Mark takes over, Mark can now follow this procedure just as easily. But, and this is the phase many people don't know about, is for the employee that's doing the work now to really embrace the work, they need to teach the work. There's a saying, the smartest student in every class is always the teacher. Well, the employee can follow a process, which is good, but when they can record their own version of this and teach it, they've become the best student. So now that Amy has our shipping procedure, she's recording her own video explaining how to do it and inserting some improvements, shortcuts she's figured out and stuff like that. So the output is even more efficient But now she's taught it. I know she's mastered the output. That is the modern version of um, putting in standard procedures into our business very efficiently and effectively. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about this next piece, which is balancing the team, adjusting roles and shifting resources to maximize efficiency and quality of the company's offering. I think this is particularly interesting to me because it seems like this is so quantitative. How do you find out uh, what everybody is best at and then adjust the roles accordingly. Yeah. So, um, the, the goal, I'll answer from the second part and then go back to the first part, finding it. So this is stage five in, in clockwork is to, it was the realization that we match often people to titles. You know, I need to hire a receptionist. I need to hire a salesperson. Um, yet a receptionist may have, you know, 10 job functions, meet people that walk in the door, answer the phones, escort people, to their meetings, um, do some data entry, do some light invoicing or whatever. So it has a you know, sequence of events. The reality is people have strengths within traits, not within titles. So you know, someone may have a great greeting ability, fantastic on the phone, warm smile, gracious to customers, but horrible at the invoicing. Does that mean that person is a bad receptionist? No, it just means that they're bad at the invoicing component that I put in the receptionist title. So match talents to traits, not talents to titles. Then um, what we do in this structure is we look at what people's strongest traits are and match it to the job functions that benefit from it. So that person that's you know, very warm and gracious with customers could be a fantastic receptionist in the greeting component, but also could be a fantastic stage one sales rep where they're just warming up uh, you know, prospects and um, educating about the company's offering, but maybe it's not the closer. So it's more of a web-like structure. And of course, the question is, how do I know what my people's strongest traits are? And there's a simple deductive process you can go through. For each employee, take sticky notes. I would do six, maybe seven or eight. Write down their, on each sticky note, their best traits, their best capabilities. You know, great at greeting, um, you know, warm smile and always optimistic, um, you know, and write the best things. You, you may notice that their invoicing ability is something you don't list. You write their only best things. Then we start taking away saying, well, they have all these traits, but of all these, 
which one is their least or lowest strength? And you take it away. Then with the remaining ones, you say, now what's the lowest? And you keep peeling it away until you have one left. That one left is their biggest strength. We then look at our organizational needs and say, where can we put this person in this organization where they can deliver on their biggest talents? And what happens is you become kind of a title-free organization. To some degree, we have that here. Some people have titles for the necessity of the customer understanding, but internally, it's a web-like structure. We don't have really a receptionist. We have someone that's really good at uh, customer intimacy. And so that person is strung through the organization in different ways to leverage that strength. Me, I'm really good at the promotional side, like marketing, uh, excitedly activating prospects around the concepts of clockwork or profit first. So my responsibility is you know, to do podcasts like we're doing now or to, to get out and do the, the video spots um, to, to be the face of the brand. But everyone knows, make sure you keep Mike away from invoicing. He'll only muckety muck things up. So it becomes a very web-like structure. I'm not the, like the president of the organization. I'm just the guy who gives good face. Uh, and if I, need, if I need to carry the title president um, because the, that'll make a customer feel uh, acknowledged, then I carry that title. If I need to carry the title of uh, a guide, which is what we use for, instead of the word coach, we actually guide our, our clientele through a uh, base, th- then I'll be a guide. And if I need to be the receptionist, I'm the receptionist. Title is irrelevant. It's it's matching traits to to talents. And, and I'm sorry, sorry or, or, or talents to tasks, but not to titles. All right. So we get two more here, which is make the commitment and become a clockwork business. Yeah. Okay. So make a commitment. Um, this is this is the sixth stage, and it confuses a lot of people when they get there. A commitment is committing to a community. What is the um client community that best is served by your offering, which sounds bass backwards because people say, but Mike, shouldn't I pick the, the customer I want to serve first and then develop something for them, constantly improve my offering? Um, there's actually a very popularized term around this. It's called pivoting. Identify the customer base you're serving, measure what they respond to. If they don't respond to it well, modify your offering until they do. And when they're consuming it, that's proven that they want what you have to offer. That's true, but there's missing a key uh, behavioral component. If we modify our offering to meet the customer needs and disregard our own, we'll actually start to resent our business. So I know many owners who've tried to pivot their business into something they resent. It's a sad state of affairs, but many business owners, I would say this, the majority, maybe a small majority, but the majority, over 50% of the business owners that I personally meet, when I ask them, how satisfying is your business? How much do you love your business? The answer is meh to I hate it. And, and that's a real problem. It's because we're pivoting. So what we've done in the clockwork process is we've built a way to streamline your business. We've capitalized on efficiencies and talents. We've organized the business. We have it humming along now. Now we say of the customers you're serving, which of the customer base is most resonating with this? Because that's the customer base we need to amplify. So master yourself, your business first then identify the community that's resonating with it strongest and grow there. That's what the commitment is. Mm, wow. Okay. And the last five, phase, uh, moving on to the, uh, the, the business that runs on automatic, the final stage is actually the extraction of the entrepreneur. So as we go through these stages, we're moving the entrepreneur up more and more to the design phase. And we're continuing the business, business to be balanced between the doing phases and the other elements without the active involvement of the owner. But the only test of a business that can run on its own is to fully extract the owner. So that's what we do. Every business that wants to run a clockwork, I argue, must have the owner take a four week consecutive four consecutive week vacation from their business. They must be removed. And this isn't just a vacation. This is a full digital disconnect, a full physical disconnect. The business needs to be running on its own independently. And when an entrepreneur can leave their business for that extended period and the business continues to grow, uh, the business continues to do well, now the business is running on automatic. And the reason we do four weeks is four weeks is the ultimate test of a business. For most businesses, they're in four-week cycles. You do collections and engage new clients and hire a new employee, admin work, maybe you lose a client, uh, you have to change pricing. All this stuff happens in four-week cycles, and then we often close out at the end of the month and say, here's the performance for this month. 
Therefore, if we remove an employee, um, the entrepreneur for a full month, we can conclude that we can likely remove them for a full year or, or permanently. So that's why we do it. Now, here's the trick. I, I am not suggesting to anyone listening in right now, tomorrow, leave for your four-week vacation. <laughs> that, that's a too abrupt of a change. What I am saying is tomorrow, declare a four-week vacation for maybe a year or two from now, or we'll just split the middle and be in a year and a half. But a year and a half from now, 16 to 18 months from now, go on a four-week vacation, put it in your calendar, lock it in, commit to others. And it doesn't, this isn't about the vacation. It's about the disconnect. So you can go to your mom-in-laws if you want, or you can go to the, the Bermuda. I, I don't care about that component. I care that you're extracted from the business. That will become the oh crap moment. So you'll, you'll 18 months from now, schedule B to be away. Then rewinding to today, you're going to say, oh my God, how am I going to pull this off? And that's the exact question you need to ask. How am I going to pull this off? Which means how am I going to make this business run on automatic? And then you start making very deliberate steps to do this, slowly chipping away at the work you're doing, moving up from deciding to delegating and ultimately purely to designing. It's a very deliberate and slow process. And I actually outlined the book, the entire 18-month schedule of things you need to do. But the big step is simply to declare that four-week vacation, which will now force you to make that a reality. Wow. Uh, This has been amazing. You've packed it with a ton of really, really tactical insight that I'm sure people are going to have to go back and and review a hundred times. So I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. Yeah. Uh, What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? I I think what makes someone unmistakable is simply, and maybe this is another use of that word, but being different, distinct. You know, I, I think it's a shame that when I ask an accountant what they do, they say, well, I'm an accountant. Or when I ask an attorney what they do, they say, I'm a lawyer. Or I ask a guy who makes pizza, what do you do? He goes, I'm a pizza guy. The problem is they're putting themselves in a very generic box. Because if you say, if you're an accountant, say, I am an accountant, you're basically saying, I am generic. Because I can only assume accountants are accountants are all the same. What I think the way to become unmistakable is to define a new term for the work you do. You're not an accountant. Maybe you're a profit advisor who uses accounting techniques, but you drive profitability. You know, you're, you're not a, a pizza guy. You're a, 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 a Friday night celebration specialist. And, and I'm not saying you use those cheesy terms, but you need to redefine your category. I do know, though, if you're using the generic term of your market, you are seen as generic, and it's the worst position to be in. If you want to be unmistakable, if you want to be different, you have to use a different label. Well, I think that makes a really fitting and uh, thought-provoking end to a really insightful conversation. Uh, where can people find out more about you, your work, and the book? Uh, thank you for offering for me to do this. I I really had a good time, and uh, and thanks for allowing me to share. Uh, my name again is Mike Michalowicz. My website is mikemichalowicz.com, which very quickly became apparent that's the worst last name any author could ever have. Um I, listen, I, st- I literally misspell my own name at least once or twice a year, and I've been living with this thing. So I found a shortcut. Um, it's Mike Motorbike. That, that's my nickname in high school. Uh, the great irony that I share with everyone is I'd never driven a motorcycle. That was just the nickname for some strange reason. But call me Mike Motorbike. So if you go to MikeMotorbike.com, thou forge on to the, my full name, Mike Michalow. It's that long Polish name. MikeMotorbike.com, you go there, and uh, all my books – are there. There's free chapter downloads from each one. So you can start experiencing this stuff immediately today. Um, I used to write for the Wall Street Journal. That's all there. I'm a podcaster. You can explore that. And um, there's tons of goodies there all for free right now at MikeMotorbike.com. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we'll wrap the show with that. Acast powers some of the world's best podcasts. Here's a show we recommend. I'm Michael Isikoff, Chief Investigative Correspondent for Yahoo News. And I'm Dan Clydman, Editor-in-Chief of Yahoo News. We've been co-hosts of the podcast Skullduggery since 2018. And now we're adding a new member to our team. I'm Victoria Bassetti, a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law School and a former Senate staffer. 
Plus, I've known these guys for years. You have indeed, Victoria. Donald Trump may be out of office, but we're going to keep digging into the latest in political trickery, underhandedness, and all manner of unscrupulous behavior. As well as analyzing the news of the day, holding the Biden White House accountable, and hearing from high-ranking members of Congress, journalists, and experts on domestic and foreign policy. So, subscribe to Skullduggery today. Find us on Acast or wherever you get your podcasts. A cash recommends.